Hey guys, welcome back to our YouTube channel. It's your girl Fanny Lungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. Uh, please check out my vlog, Morning Coffee with Fanny, and just uh, and enjoy the content that I put out there. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Fanny and Jesse, and just feel free to interact with us. If there's something that you guys want me to react to, drop the link in the comment section below, and I'll be more than glad to react to it. I hope you guys are doing all right, and may you stay blessed. So today I'm going to be reacting to these Christian, these Christian missionaries who are making life miserable for me. I'm into that. So without wasting time, let's let's get into the video. Beginning at the beginning, how did I get started in this field of activity? Soon after leaving school, I started working in a country shop, somewhere out of the city of Durban, about 25 miles out. There was a Muslim shop, and across the valley from the shop was a Christian mission. So these missionaries, that they were getting their training how to do jihad, the crusades against the Muslims, whatever they learned, they came to practice on the Muslims in the shop. All young men just have school, cheap labor. They would come into the shop to buy sugar and salt, flour, rice. But when they came to do the purchases, they would start with us. He says, you know, your prophet Muhammad had so many wives. And I knew nothing about that. About the wives of the Prophet, our mothers, I knew nothing about that. They would say that your Prophet Muhammad, he spread his religion at the point of the sword. He forced Islam down people's throats, that if you don't accept Islam, I'll chop off your head. That's how he got the converts. I knew nothing about that. They say that the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he copied his book, the Quran, from the Jews and the Christians. This is the copy, imitation of the Christian Bible. I knew nothing about that. The only thing I knew about Islam was that I was a Muslim. And I read the Shahada, the Kalima. If I met any of you during that period, in my teens, and if I ask you where you come from, you say Kenya. I say what you? Meaning what religion you belong to. You say you're a Muslim. I say read the Shahada. So if you could say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, I said pass, you pass. <laughs> but what that meant, I didn't know. It was like a magic formula. If you can say it, you are a Muslim. If you can't say it, you're not a Muslim. That's all I knew. Can you say Shahada? Say, yes. say it. I hear it, I say right, you pass. I prayed the way my father prayed. I made song fasting the way my father fasted. I made wudu the way my father did. Everything. I was a Muslim, read the Shahada, and led an ordinary Muslim life. What these Christians are posing to me, I knew nothing about that. They're making life miserable for me and for the other Muslim staff. You feel like running away. But where can you go? There was no jobs to get. Jobs were difficult. So you stick it out. And, but I'm looking for an answer. I want Allah to help me. Ya Allah. This misery, what am, I, what am I bargaining for here? I come to eke out a living and these Christians are making life miserable for me. But there was one thing I had. I had an obsession for reading. Reading was my pastime. Anything, everything. Reading, reading, reading. Anything I see in writing, I would read. That was a sickness I had. And to, to meet the requirement of this sickness of mine, one Sunday morning, I go to my boss's warehouse, his go down, and rummaging through a pile of old newspapers, looking for something to read better than an old newspaper. At the worst, I'll take the old newspapers and I read them. Because whatever I read was news. Six months old, a year old. No, whatever I read, I didn't know. It's news for me. I didn't know that today is news today. You must know what's happening today. No, no, that I didn't know. If I read anything I didn't know, it's news. So, at the worst, newspaper. I will take it into my room, start reading. But in the meantime, I'm looking for magazines. 
better than the newspaper. So I move a pile of newspapers and find one magazine, put it one side. I move some more newspapers and get another magazine, I put it one side. While rummaging through this old pile of newspapers, I come across a worm-eaten book, reddish in color. I pick it up, full of mildew. When I pick it up, I start to sneeze. Shh, shh. Start to sneeze because of the mildew, worm-eaten. And on the cover was written, is Harul Haq. Spelled out in English, Latin script. I Z H A R U L H A K. Is Harul Haq. Sounds like Muslim. Is Harul Haq. I say, sound like Muslim. But what is Is Harul Haq? I don't know. At the bottom, in brackets, in smaller types, is written the truth revealed. So I say, ah, maybe this word Is Harul Haq means the truth revealed. So I sit down on the ground in the dust. And I start reading. I've got no time to waste. There, there, I'm hungry. I want to read. What is it all about? So I read, started reading this book there on the ground, in the dust. That this book was written by an Arab, Rahmatullah Hindi, to help the Indian Muslims to give battle to the Nasara, the Christians. It speaks about the British conquest of India. As the British came and conquered your country, conquered Ghana, conquered Nigeria, they conquered India, they conquered Malaysia. When they conquered my country, India, they realized that at any time anybody will give them trouble, in India will be the Muslims. Because power, rule, dominion was wrenched out of their hand. And once you have tasted power, you aspire for it once more. So the problem is the Muslim. If you can convert the Muslim, if you can teach him to turn the other cheek, like Jesus said, he who strikes you on the right cheek, do him the other. Once you make the Muslim to do that, then you can rule India for a thousand years. So convert the Muslim. So they started pouring in the missionaries like frogs in the rainy season. The Christian missionaries, they started coming into India. And they started challenging the Muslims to public debates. Munazira. At first the Muslims were reluctant. Number one, they didn't know the language. The British are speaking English. I want to talk to you and debate with you in English. He said, I don't know English. Our aliens didn't know English. Number two, they had just conquered us. And if you speak too hard, too harsh, they might send us to the Andaman Islands, black waters, like the Robben Island in South Africa, out of the way. Shh, you want to take a chance? <coughs> so the Muslims were not cooperative. They didn't want to debate. Number one, language problem. Number two, fear. So the Christian missionaries, they mastered our language. Urdu. The language of the elite, the alims. And they started challenging us to debate with you in your language. Like our alim might say, look, we only know, know, know Swahili. So the guy learns Swahili. He said, right, your alim, bring him in Swahili. We want to debate with him. Can you say no? In your language. So the Muslims were forced to accept. And Maulana Abdul Aziz of Delhi, he accepted the challenge. He was forced to accept the challenge. And the debate takes place. And I'm told in the book that a hundred thousand people gathered. There was no sound system, no horns, nothing. How the voice traveled, Allah knows best. But people were there watching from far and they say, well, what's going on? Somebody is giving a commentary. You say, you know, the Maulana gave one uppercut like that. And this guy said, this commentaries are going on. No sound system. There was no sound system those days. So debate starts. With the reverend, the reverend founder by name, reverend founder, the Britisher. He suggests to the Maulana that Maulana Sahib, respected Maulana Alim, get started. So the Maulana says, you see, Christianity preceded Islam by 600 years. As such, you are our elder brother. You are 600 years older than us. And according to our culture, our elder brother has the first chance. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, he says, you are our guest. You are a guest in our country. No doubt an unwelcome guest, but still you are a guest. So according to our culture, you have the first preference. So the reverend was forced to start. And he started with a question, with a poser, with a riddle. Said Maulana Sahib in Urdu, speaking in Urdu. Maulana Sahib respected Alim, Maulana. Where is your prophet Muhammad now, now, this minute? Where is he now? So the Maulana thought for a moment. And he said, he is in Jannatul Firdaus. Heavenly bliss, 
with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of that answer came the second question. He said, all right, all right. If your prophet was with this Allah, where was he when his grandson Hussein was martyred at Karbala? When Yazid chopped off his head, where was your prophet Muhammad then? So the Maulana again thought for a moment and he said he was still in Jannatul Firdaus, heavenly bliss with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of that answer came the third question. It was planned strategy. He said, all right, all right. If your Muhammad was with his Allah when his grandson Hussein was martyred, killed, slaughtered at Karbala, did he not ask his Allah for help? Say, Ya Bari Tala, oh my Lord, look what they're doing to my grandson. Please help him out of his difficulty. Didn't he ask his Allah for help? And there was a long pause. And the, the, the priest couldn't hold his patience. He started stamping his feet. So, come on, come on. Did he not ask his Allah for help? It's natural, natural. If you have a big brother, somebody's bullying you, you say, brother, look, man, look at this guy here. What is he doing to me? You naturally, you call for help. And your Allah is there, the Almighty, the All-Powerful, and you're not going to ask him for help? He says, come on, come on. Did he or didn't he ask his Allah for help? So the Maulana, he said, yes, he did. He did ask Allah for help. Then what did Allah say? Because we know he wasn't saved. What did Allah say? And there was an inordinate, very long pause. And the priest again lost his patience, started stamping. He said, come on, come on. What did Allah say? So the Mawlana starts. He says, Allah cried. Allah cried. So what? Allah cried? He said, yes, Allah cried. He said, I couldn't save my own son, Jesus. How can I save your grandson? <laughs> over. The debate was over. You see, the debate had nothing to do with facts. Facts. It was a matching of the wits. Cleverness. Who is the cleverer of the two wins the battle. And Alhamdulillah, the Maulana won the battle. I mean, we should be very, very ashamed that we're going to learn something just to attack someone. Imagine learning about feminism so that you can go attack a man. Imagine learning or gaining knowledge at school so that you can go attack someone that um, is not educated. Doesn't make sense to me. Otherwise, I love the ending of the video. I've actually reacted to the end of the video. The first part, not so much. Just the end. I think in the last one minute um, concerning the debate that was going on that was very very funny like even if you don't want to laugh that day when you're hearing this it's surely going to put a smile on your face otherwise let me know what you guys think about this there's something you guys want me to react to let me know down below by dropping a link and make sure to give this video a thumbs up share it with your friends and of course do not forget to subscribe and i'll see you in my next reaction video